audiobook, Simply This Moment. 8 Human Rights in Buddhism, 1. Damaloka Buddhist Center. 9th of June 2000. I have just returned this afternoon from a three-week trip to Malaysia and Singapore. It was an exhilarating and inspiring trip. I gave many Dhamma teachings and also attended a Buddhist conference. When I gave the talk there were two black Marias full of riot police stationed outside the venue in the CBD in Singapore. I gave the talk to a very large crowd of over a thousand people in one of the auditoriums. So here in Damaloka I feel I'm with a nice cozy group of friends. I actually found out later on, and I was quite disappointed, that the riot police weren't there for my talk but for a karaoke bar and nightclub next door. It would have been something if I could have put in my biography that so many people attended one of my talks the authorities had to station riot police outside. It was wonderful to see so many people interested in learning about meditation and listening to the Dhamma. Actually, it shows that in those countries, Malaysia has something like a 26% Buddhist population and Singapore around 4-5%, to they are very short of good teachers. They need good teachers to teach Buddhism in a way that makes sense and is relevant to human life in a profound way. Not telling people what they already know but challenging them to find a deeper, more accurate way of looking at life. And the Dhamma must be entertaining. Especially in places like Malaysia and Singapore where the people are so stressed out. The last thing they want is a lecture. They want a little fun now and again, with a little bit of Dhamma in between. That's my style. I also attended the first global conference on Buddhism in order to see other ideas in Buddhism, to widen my own perspective on the Buddha's teachings and also to participate and give some input on the West Australian experience of Buddhism. The tradition at this Buddhist center is a John Chaz Forest tradition. It's a tradition that is extremely vibrant all over the world. I would like to talk this evening about a topic that was presented at that conference by one of the speakers, a professor in Buddhist studies from England, the relevance of human rights to Buddhism. It was only a 20-minute presentation but it struck a chord with me because about two years ago someone asked me if I could give a talk on that subject. Because of one thing or another, I was going overseas or teaching a retreat or something, I never got around to it. What's the relevance of human rights to Buddhism? This is a very important subject. It is something many people talk about. It gives them a direction, whether for good or for bad. So I thought this would be a good opportunity, while it's fresh in my mind, to talk about Buddhism and human rights. Rights and freedoms. One of the things that really impressed me with the talk I heard at the conference was that the whole idea of human rights is a very Western idea. It basically comes from the Judeo Christian culture. In many places, especially in the East, people have a lot of trouble with human rights. Not so much in its fairness and the role of just high cell, but in what underpins it. Where does it come from? Why human rights? Without an understanding of the underlying theory behind human rights, it sometimes doesn't make much sense. For example, when I reflect on the principles and work out the Consequences, I am amused by the human right that everyone is born equal. That might be so according to Christianity or Judaism but it certainly isn't correct. According to Buddhism, so far as Buddhists are concerned, we are not all born equal. Some people are born big, some people are born small. Some people are born intelligent, some people are born stupid. The point is we come into this world with our karma from past lives. So, straight away, for a Buddhist, that principle of equality at birth doesn't make sense. Even as a young man it never made sense to me. I could see that when people were born they certainly were not equal. 
This is just an idea. Even though it is a noble idea it isn't true. Throughout my life as a monk I've always preferred truth. What actually is to what I would like it to be? Idealism has its place but surely it must be founded on truth and reality. Otherwise we are just building a fantasy that doesn't really have any meaning or any solid foundation in the reality of our lives. Isn't it true that each one of you came into this world with advantages over some people and disadvantaged compared to others? It's called the law of Kama. The other thing that doesn't make sense in the Western idea of human rights is the whole idea of freedom. So often our societies, especially in the Western world dash, celebrate this idea of freedom, and we think we live in the so-called free world. Governments and societies are trying to enshrine that idea of freedom into different societies but basically I don't think they know what the word means. Because of that, they get into so much trouble and difficulty and create a lot of mischief for society. Just as we do in our own little societies and in the home, we know what the rights and freedoms in our society are, but what does that freedom mean? When you start to apply the law of Kama to this idea of human rights and freedoms there are some things that don't make sense. What I've seen in the world is that people want the freedom of desire. They want to be free to express their desire. Free to follow their desires at whatever cost. What Buddhism wants, what Buddhism celebrates, is not the freedom of desire, but freedom from desire. That's going in a completely different direction. One of the stories I told at the conference was the story of the wishing game. Five children were playing this wishing game. The first one was asked, if you had a wish what would you want and the child said, if I had a wish I would want an ice cream. She liked ice cream. The second child who was a little bit older said, if I had a wish I'd wish for an ice cream factory. The first child thought that was really clever because if you had an ice cream factory you could get an ice cream whenever you wanted one. Not just one ice cream but hundreds of ice creams. The third child was asked, what's your wish and he said, I'd like a billion dollars. Because with a billion dollars I can buy an ice cream factory, a cake factory, a fish and chip shop or whatever else I want, and I could do a lot more. The first two kids thought, wow, aren't we stupid? Why didn't we have think of that? They thought that this young fellow who wished for a billion dollars was a genius. But the next child when asked what he wished did even better than wanting a billion dollars, he said, I wish I had three wishes, so that I could wish for an ice cream factory with my first wish, a billion dollars with my second wish, and with my third wish I could wish for another three wishes. They thought, wow, you can't do better than that. Can you think of a wish that is even better than that? To have three wishes and the third wish is that you can wish for another three wishes? But the last child did surpass that, he was the Buddha to be, and said, I wish I had no wishes. Isn't that interesting? Because when you have no more wishes it means that you are completely content. You're free from all desires. You're free from all that wanting. You're free from all feeling of lack the feeling that somewhere in your life, somewhere in your body, somewhere in your mind, something is missing. Imagine what it would be like if you had no more wishes, completely happy with whatever comes along, completely happy with this present moment. You don't wish for it to be anything else. You look at your husband and he's absolutely perfect. You don't wish him to change at all. You look at your wife and she's so beautiful. You don't wish her to be anything different, neither better nor worse. No more wishing is going against the grain of modern society isn't it? We want to have the freedom to have more wishes. We want the freedom to have more choices and more money to express our choices. 
we want more freedom to express our individuality. Buddhism says the cleverest child is the child who wishes for no more wishes. So, the freedoms that people celebrate and enshrine in such documents as the Declaration of Human Rights, are basically the freedom to follow desire. I remember reading in one of the great philosophical cartoon strips, Calvin and Hobbes, about an American boy who had just learned from his teacher that ignorance is bliss. He knew it was guaranteed by the American Constitution that you had the right to the pursuit of happiness. So he added the two together and said, If I'm guaranteed my right to pursue happiness and ignorance is bliss, why am I going to school? It's strange, isn't it, what we talk about as freedoms in the world? Freedom of expression. These things are not freedoms, they actually imprison you. For instance, consider the freedom to express yourself. Do you actually feel free when you've got so much? choice? When you go into the supermarket or into the shops, there is so much choice. When there is so much choice it can make life so difficult. Wasn't it lovely when there was only one brand of muesli? It was good enough, you quite enjoyed it, but now you've got a choice between so many different brands. That's the problem with freedom. It's just so complicated, so troublesome for the mind. Sometimes freedom just gives you a headache. What brand should I take? I'm challenging you here. The whole idea of these talks is to make you look at things in different ways. Buddhism gives you a different perspective on things. That's half the job of mindfulness, too. Open up different ways of looking, different ways of seeing, and different ways of practicing. So, Instead of actually looking at freedom as the freedom to indulge desire, maybe we should aim for and aspire towards freedom from desire. A Buddhist declaration of human rights would be very different from the human rights that people celebrate in the world. They call it the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but I don't think that they consulted Buddhists or anybody else for that matter. They just call it universal because it sounds universal to them. It's completely dogmatic and insensitive at times. Obviously with human rights there are some things that all people would want to recognize as worth protecting. The aim of human rights is to protect. All people want freedom from oppression and freedom from being treated unfairly. We do need regulations and laws to protect the weak from the strong. I think one of the goals of the Declaration of Human Rights is to protect the so-called level playing fields. This is not only to protect freedom of expression, of speech, but to protect religious expression as well. I was quiet surprised in Singapore and Malaysia to find that Buddhists were afraid to express their religion openly. I expected it in Malaysia because it's a Muslim country. Buddhists there are very afraid to express their religion, especially when it comes to the point of building temples. They are afraid to say exactly what they are doing because they would never be given building permits or be allowed to actually practice. In one place where they are building, they plan to plant trees on the edge of the property so that no one will be able to see what is happening inside because the Malays might be upset and stop them. Sometimes they don't even have a Buddha statue. One meditation center I went to was officially an estate manager's because, if they called it a meditation center, they would be closed down. I had expected that in Malaysia but I was surprised that they were hypersensitive even in Singapore to what was going on. I took part in a three-hour talkback radio show in Singapore. It was really good fun. But the presenter told me beforehand not to mention Buddhism or the word meditation. Otherwise he'd get the sack. Because the people are so hypersensitive, you couldn't really express who you were. The organizers of the conference that I attended really thought that the riot police and the two Black Marias dash that I mentioned earlier, 
were from the government. So many people in the government in Singapore are heavy evangelical Christians that the organizers were afraid because so many people were going to a Buddhist lecture. When we consider human rights or the idea of freedom, we see that there are some things that should be done. Giving people freedom to choose, especially their religion, and allowing people to express their religion, is one example. We should not be brainwashing people. I heard today that someone has bought the lease of a powerful transmitter in the Northern Territory and is blasting Christian propaganda across Southeast Asia. That's not going to make us many friends in the Muslim world. It's a silly thing to do. When pursuing human rights and freedom we have to be very mindful and have loving kindness, compassion, and sensitivity to the people around us. In Buddhism it's not freedom for freedom's sake. I can't go and do just whatever I want or preach Buddhism to anybody I see. That was one of the reasons I was personally very impressed with Buddhism. The Buddhist monks and teachers I knew weren't ramming Buddhism down my throat. They weren't telling me that if I did not believe in Buddhism I would go to hell. That happens in some religions. People have told me in Malaysia and Singapore that sometimes their children come home from school very upset, because the teachers tell them that their mummy and daddy are going to go to hell because they are Buddhists. That is really too much. So I told the Buddhists, even in Malaysia, to stand up for themselves. If any Christian comes and tells you the Buddha wasn't God, he wasn't even a prophet. He was just an ordinary man, say, hang on, that's only partly true. It's true the Buddha wasn't a god. It's true he wasn't a prophet or a son of God, but he was the teacher of God. The place of the Buddha in the scheme of things. According to the suttas, according to the actual teachings of the Buddha in the scriptures, is that our Buddha is your God's teacher. That's true. In Pali Satha. Devamanasana, means the teacher of gods and men. That is in the chant that you did if you were doing the puja, devotional offerings, at 7 o'clock. Itipiso Bhagava Irahu Samasam Buddho. Vijjakara Asampano Shugato Lokavadu. Anatha Uro Purisa Damasaradi Satha Devamanasana. Satha means teacher, Devamanasana means of gods and men, there are many. Places in the suttas where it is recorded that the Buddha went up to heaven to see Brahma and taught him the Dhamma. One of those exchanges is in the Brahmanimanta Ike Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. MN 49. The Buddha went to see Brahma by using his psychic powers, but one of the attendants in Brahma's assembly said, Do you know this is Brahma? You should go and bow down to him, he is God, the Almighty the Creator, etc. 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 The Buddha replied, No way, Brahma is making a big mistake. He tried to teach Brahma that he was subject to the law of Kama and subject to the law of impermanence, and that he had come to his present state from another world. Brahma was actually born into his role. The role of God, of Brahma, is just a job, a position which falls vacant at the end of the universe. Someone else gets it next time. That's the Buddhist teaching. Of course Brahma didn't believe him. The only thing that eventually convinced Brahma was a psychic contest. Brahma said, Look, I can vanish, and you won't be able to find me, and the Buddha denied this. According to the Sada the God tried to vanish but wherever Brahma went the Buddha followed. I think that is because Brahma lives in the highest of the sensory realms and he can go from there into the first jhana realm. But when the Buddha went into the second jhana realm that was beyond Brahma's conception and experience, he couldn't find the Buddha. The Buddha won the psychic contest and, because of that, Brahma realized that this was no ordinary person and started to listen and understand the laws of impermanence.
He understood that he wasn't a permanent being in this universe. He wasn't the Almighty, the permanent, etc. He understood he was just like any other being, subject to the law of Kama, subject to impermanence. That was when Brahma became a disciple of the Buddha. So, if anyone knocks on your door and asks if you believe in God, you can say, yes. But we also believe in the Buddha and that the Buddha is your God's teacher. That way you will get rid of them pretty quickly. Only say this if they get heavy with you. Because we want to be diplomatic. We want to be kind, but sometimes it's worth fighting fire with fire. Buddhists should at least stand up for their beliefs, understand what their beliefs are, and not just be wimps. Freedom of Inquiry I spoke in Malaysia about such things as the Gnostic Gospels, which is another tradition of Christianity. In early Christianity there were three strands of Christian belief. One was the Church at Jerusalem, which was basically a Jewish Christianity. They were still circumcising each other and keeping the Jewish traditions. It wasn't very popular with the Gentiles in Rome because they didn't have anesthetic in those days. The Gentile church was found in many other centers outside of Jerusalem. Places like Antioch, Corinth, and Rome. Then there were the Gnostic Christians. They weren't centered anywhere but were an independent strand of Christianity with no hierarchy or organization but with groups of people meeting in many different places. When Jerusalem fell in 70 AD, because the Romans were, for one reason or another dash, fed up with the Jewish people, they tore down the temple and dispersed the people. This action destroyed the Jewish Christian church and from then on it was a contest between the Gnostic Christians and the much better organized, more powerful, Roman Christians. Little by little, this is just basic history not a John Brom making it up dash. The Gnostic Christians were suppressed, considered heretics, and eventually annihilated by the Roman Christians. They were killed, their books were burned, and their libraries were destroyed. It's strange but when you try and suppress anything, when you try and hide something, especially bad karma or mistakes, it usually turns up again somewhere. In 1945 somebody, in a place called Nag Hammadi in southern Egypt, found some old texts, old papyrus manuscripts, dating I think to the 1st and 2nd centuries ad, which came to be called the Gnostic Gospels. They can be seen at the Nag Hammadi Library. In these texts there are actual sayings of Jesus Christ that are very, very different from what we read in the Bible. If you are interested in another form of Christianity it's very interesting to read things that give a different slant to that religion. You can look up a book called The Gnostic Gospels by Elaine Pagels, who is professor of religious studies at Princeton University in America. The reason I'm saying this is because one of the teachings in the texts quotes Jesus as saying that God was in his heaven one day saying, I am the firstborn, the creator, the Lord of all that is and ever was, the most powerful, etc., etc. Then someone says, no you're not. Don't get above yourself God. There are other beings in this universe which you simply do not know about. God replied, who said that? Why are you saying that? That is in the Gnostic Christian Gospels, which puts God in a very different place from that depicted in Roman Christianity. I mention this because when we have more knowledge and understanding, when we have more information, we get a much wider and broader picture of things. It's that wider knowledge that is one of the things that should be a basic freedom for all human beings. Knowledge should be freely available. It shouldn't be slanted or biased. According to certain people's views or religion's agendas, there are some freedoms that we love to have, that are really our right. One of those freedoms that we would certainly put in a Buddhist charter of human rights is the right to freedom of inquiry, freedom of information, and freedom to question. It is by 
questioning that we find the truth. The Buddha encouraged us not to just sit back and listen, or to only take a book and study it, but to also question. One of the suttas lists the five things that help one become a stream winner, the first stage of enlightenment. It starts off with sila, virtue, morality, keeping precepts and continues with these two beautiful words sutta and sakaka. Sutta means literally listening to Dhamma discourses. You might call it learning or having the informational input about the Buddha's teachings. Sakaka means discussion and asking questions. The other two factors, interestingly, are Samatha and Vipassana. Calm and insight. These are the five supporting factors for the arising of enlightenment. Here I'm just focusing on Sutta and Sakaka, the ability to have the information and also to discuss it. One of the things that really attracted me to Buddhism was that I could ask any question, even though they were sometimes silly questions, because the teachers respected and honored questioning. Those teachers would never make a questioner feel silly or embarrassed by saying, what a stupid question that is, you foolish person. Don't ask that question again. I've tried all my life never to do that. If someone asks me a question, even though I sometimes think, what a dumb question. Haven't you been listening? I always try to answer it fully. I've had some dumb questions in my time. Probably the hardest and most foolish question I was ever asked was when I was giving a talk, many years ago, to 14-year-old girls in a high school. After my talk on Buddhism, I expected the questions to be on Buddhism. But this one girl put her hand up and asked, Do girls turn you on? That was a hard one to handle. Whenever I asked a dumb question, although I never asked questions, like that of monks. Dash the monk would always be very patient with me and would actually explain very gently saying, look, you're misunderstanding, you should have asked the question in this way. But they would never make you feel small because you had asked a stupid question. I really appreciated that because it showed a sense of kindness and respect. The teacher respected the student. To question is a right for people. That's why I say, whatever question you have, come and ask it. I may not know the answer. It may take me a while, and sometimes. You may not be satisfied with my answer, but always ask the question. Often when people ask questions and I reply, I ask them if the answer is okay. Did I answer the question satisfactorily? Did I understand the question? That's respect for the person who had the guts to put their hand up and ask. I act like this because of my own past experience. Sometimes I've asked a question. And because the person hasn't really understood it, or because the question is simply a bit too hard for them, or it's showing them they've made a mistake, they skirt around it or make a joke of it. I remember Krishnamurti, the teacher, I was quite interested in his teachings for a while. Later I heard a recording of one of his talks given in the New York Library. It was quite a famous talk. I've seen the audio cassette in public libraries. I was really interested in the talk and at the end there were a lot of stupid questions. Krishnamurti answered those questions reasonably well, but then someone asked a really good question, which was very deep and challenged much of what he had said. I was disgusted when the answer was, with a very condescending and superior voice, do I have to answer everything? The audience laughed. But this poor man was ridiculed even though it was the best question of the session. Krishnamurti just skirted around it with humor, and I thought that was really wrong. I tell people that if lecturers at universities really know their stuff, if they are really experts at their subjects, they can answer any questions. If they skirt around questions, or are afraid of questions, it's a good sign that they don't know what they are talking about. 
I told the people in Malaysia and Singapore, and I give the same advice to you. There are so many teachers and gurus, monks and nuns and goodness knows. Whatever, floating around the world today, you should ask them difficult questions. That's the only way to find out if they know their stuff. Ask them the hardest questions, the most probing questions, and see if they answer them with a sense of equanimity, with a sense of respect, not like a politician avoiding the issue but like someone who knows what they are talking about. If you know, you are not afraid of questions. This is a good way for people to check on teachers, on gurus, on monks, or nuns who go around the world teaching. There is a huge danger in believing charlatans. So ask deep questions. I think in any charter of Buddhist human rights we should have the right to question anybody and the right to demand a fair answer, whether it's from politicians, preachers, or whoever, because I think that would protect truth, and access to the truth should be an inalienable right for people, an inalienable right for all. Find out what your governments are doing. Find out what your doctor says about you, what they have diagnosed you as having. But especially in religion we should have the freedom to find out the truth but have the freedom to find out the truth but have the freedom to find out the truth but have the freedom to find out the truth.